All right, let's get started. So today we'll talk about working with text data. And so as I already announced last time, um, this is the start of talking about different kinds of data um, than we did so far. So, so far we had usually a fixed number of features and we talked about uh, continuous features and categorical features. And maybe we derived new features from the features we already had, but we had a fixed length representation for each data point. So next we will talk about things where there's not really a predefined notion of features, in particular um, free text and images and time series, where we have to come up with what is our representation of the data going to look like. Um, other cases are uh, audio, video, and graphs, but we'll not talk about those. So very typically text data looks something like this. So this is from uh, IMDb movie reviews. And so here it says, may contain spoilers. A dupe in a dopey looking Kong suit uh, provides much of the laughs in this much mocked monster flake, and so on. And um, so this is an arbitrary text. There's another one below, and they have uh, no fixed length. Um, they're not it's all strings, it's not floating points, so it's sort of not something we could put into any of the models we talked about directly. You'll also see that there's um, here, for example, there's some uh, HTML in there for some reason, or the person that wrote a second review in the bottom likes to use a lot of punctuation and smileys, um, and uh, maybe there's typos in there, Maybe there's like, I don't know what a Magilla Gorilla is, but uh, that's certainly a word that's not very common in the English language. So this is a type of data we'll talk about uh, most today, which is sort of uh, an arbitrary sort of long text. There's other types of text um, that I want to briefly mention. So this is, this could be a movie review here, or it could be a book or a report or uh, the content of a website, anything like that. But basically this is sort of English language text. Um, something that's sort of on the boundary of this is tweets. In particular, people used to work on tweets a lot when they were 140 characters. 140 characters are very short. Um, maybe this gets easier now because it's like 200, what, 280? Um, but if you have these very short sentences, you don't have a lot of context. And people use like weird language in tweets. So these were kind of hard to use. Um, but there's other types of data, text data that are um, free strings, but not really um, English language text. So uh, here, this is a data set I'll come back to later. This is people in the European um, Parliament. And so you can see there's a country, there's the name of the person, ID, the national political group, and political group uh, on the EU. And so most of these are strings. A uh, country you would think is a categorical, which we already talked about. One thing we didn't really talk about is that if you let a user specify a category, it's never going to be really unique. They're going to make typos. They're going to spell things differently. They might say UK for United Kingdom or England or um, uh, GB or Great Britain. And these are not the same, but they're sort of uh, mean similar things. But uh, if you encode this as a categorical variable, you will lose that. So even if something's sort of like a categorical variable, there might be additional information in there. Um, there's another, th the second one, the names, these are not words, and we'll talk a little bit in the end about how to deal with this. Um, this is not that common, but if you have something like uh, names or street names, city names, um, maybe you want to learn something from th those, um, or like made up words um, in some context, uh, could be company names, and so you might want to learn about single words and sort of what they mean, um, even though sort of they might appear only once. 
And uh, the other two columns here, um, I mean, more generally, these are uh, noun phrases. Uh, here, particularly, these are named entities. So, noun phrase would be anything that has um, multiple words that describe the one entity. So, here, uh, there are several words that belong together to describe this entity, United Kingdom Independence Party. And so, um, you could treat this as words, but that's not really the way that you wanted to treat it. You want to uh, recognize that this is a description as a single unit of a thing, and you want to separate um, this. And finding these uh, named entities in uh, general text is like a whole area of research in natural language processing, and we're not going to talk about that. Um, I just wanted to mention it, that this is something that people have, have thought about a lot, and uh, something you'll definitely come across in practice. So the thing that I want to talk about most of the time is you have free text in the language, um, let's say English. And the most classical approach, which is sort of the mother of all approaches that everything else is built on, is the bag of words approach. And so I want to walk through the bag of words approach uh, for a bit. So let's say you start with a string. So here um, you have a very short string. This is how you get ants. Again, this could be like a whole book. The first step you do is you um, tokenize, which means you break this up into words. Uh, here, this is done very simply um, by just breaking on the white space. Um, there was also some normalization going on here. Uh, we lowercase everything. And I'm going to talk about these steps later. So, uh, but very often you can get some good idea of what are the words by just breaking on white space. Um, this works clearly, that works well for uh, English, it works well for German, but it doesn't work for Chinese at all. Um, so this approach mostly works, or at least is much easier on things where white space declare uh, the now, uh, word boundaries, which is not true for all languages. Okay, but so now we identified the words that make up uh, the sentence. Now we can do this for our whole corpus. So let's say um, this we have uh, data sets are called corpuses in NLP and uh, single samples are called documents. So this string in the beginning would be my document and the corpus would be the whole data set of all the strings that I have. So now I do this tokenization to all the documents I have and I build a vocabulary over all the words that I've seen. So this is something like all the words in the English language. And depending on the size of your corpus, you will get like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of distinct words. So let's say here we have words from our back to uh, six. Then to encode this document that you started with, this is how you get ants, you count for each word in your vocabulary how often does it appear in this string? And most words appear zero times. Artwork appears zero times, Amsterdam appears zero times, uh, ants appears once, most of the other things appear zero times, get appears once, you appears once, and so on. So you have this very long vector that is um, like, let's say, 100,000 uh, entries long, if your vocabulary is 100,000, and you have six entries in there that are all one. The good thing is now that you have a fixed length representation for all the documents in your corpus. So all of your strings are now represented by these hundred, by a 100,000 dimensional vector and you can just do your standard machine learning on this vector. Clearly storing all these zeros would be a big waste of space. And so usually uh, these back of word representations are stored as uh, sparse matrices. So we only remember the ones, not the zeros. So um, in, in that case, the storage space for our string would be something like you only store the six non-zero values, you don't store 100,000 zeros. Questions so far? So let's do a toy example 
So here I have a corpus with two documents. Do you want ants? Because that's how you get ants. And uh, back of word is implemented in the count vectorizer in scikit-learn in the feature extraction.txt module. This is a transformer, so it behaves mostly like other transformers in scikit-learn, but it's kind of pretty special in a sense in that it's one of the few things in scikit-learn that doesn't take matrices in, it takes in a list of strings. So here you can see Mallory, which is the, it's the whole data set, is uh, a list of strings. And so the fit method gets a list of strings, and this builds the vocabulary. So uh, a good way to look at the vocabulary in the count vectorizer is calling get feature names. And so here I show the result of get feature names, and you can see the vocabulary uh, consists of ands, because, do, get, how, that, want, you. And so you see it's, everything was lowercase, the apostrophe s we lost, uh, and the, the punctuation we lost. Now that I have this vocabulary, I can transform the two strings that I had, do you want ants, because that's how you get ants, um, into the back of word representation. And you can see this here. So the transform actually produces a sparse array that's not easy to print. So I, sorry, a space sparse matrix. And so I call two arrays to, to get a dense array uh, so I can easily print it. Usually, if you would call two array on a sparse matrix, um, it will make it dense, and so it'll be too big for your memory, or at least will waste a lot of memory. But in this hard example, I can of course do this. So here you can see for the first string, do you want ants? I have a one for ants. I have a one. I have a zero for because. I have a one for do. I have a zero for get. Zero for how. Zero for that. One for want. One for you. Great. Um, and then the same for the other string. Okay, so why is this called the bag of words? Um, it's called a bag of words because you completely ignore the order of the words. You can see this, for example, by if you look at the inverse transform. So count vectorizer allows you to go from some representation uh, in the from the bag of words representation back to strings. And so if you take these strings, you want ends, and you uh, transform it, then you inverse transform it back. What you get is ends do want you. And so imagine this would be a whole long book. If you try to inverse transform it, you will just get a list of the unique words in the book. So basically, you shove all the words in the big bag, and you um, forget about their order and their context. So now um, I want to use this in uh, this IMDb movie data set. And I want to classify reviews in good reviews and bad reviews. So, sorry, positive and negative reviews. So saying whether the movie is good or the movie is bad. Um, here, I'm, there's a function in scikit-learn load files that's used to load text files where each file corresponds to a document and each folder corresponds to a class. Um, because that's sort of how commonly text data sets are stored. And so uh, I do that, and so uh, for the training part, and um, so xtrainval is now a list of length 25,000. And if I look at ytrainval, there's uh, 12,500 zeros and 12,500 ones. So it's a balanced classification problem. The way this was annotated. Um, was the each review comes with a star rating from one to ten, and I think if it was one, two, or three, uh, the creator of the data set said this is a negative review. If it's seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that, it's a positive review, and if it's in the middle, we just discard it. Um, here's yeah, what's one of the examples looks like. Um, it, now, hopefully, everybody uses Python 3, where everything is Unicode by default. Uh, so to print it, I call uh, 
decode, which will um, well, give me the decoded Unicode uh, string. So you can see here, for example, that there was uh, some Unicode in there for cliche. Um, and there's no HTML in here right now. It's useful to look at the data, of course, to see what are the, uh, is there something weird with it? Uh, like the HTML markup, I'm gonna strip all the HTML from it, uh, assuming it didn't mean anything. If it meant something, maybe I shouldn't have stripped it. Um, also, like if you keep the accent or not on the cliche, we'll make it two different words. So if someone uh, types it one way or the other way, these two words in the back of word representation will be two distinct features that have nothing to do with each other. So even though they're like nearly, look nearly the same to the model, they're completely unrelated. Cool. So now I vectorize this. Um, so I, re I replaced all the, um, the line breaks because, I mean, I don't really need to, but it looks kind of ugly. Um, split the data set, fit it on the training data set, and transform the training and evaluation data set. And um, so you can see the result X train is a sparse matrix. Um, there's 18,750 uh, rows. So the training data set is uh, after 25,000, we have about uh, 19,000 points left, and there's 66,000 um, words in the vocabulary that was built here. So we have 66,000 features. Uh, we can look at these features. So here, the first 10 are kind of not very interesting. They're 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, I'm not going to read this. Um, well, they're all numbers, and they, they're sorted alphabetically, so they all start with a bunch of zeros. Um, if I look in the, somewhere in the middle, <coughs> excuse me, I get a bunch of English words like escort, escorted, especially escrow, escrow names, Eskimos, and uh, like, I don't know actually what all of these mean. Some of these might be typos, some of these might be like uh, names, but okay, it kind of makes sense. Um, to get a more general overview, I look at every uh, 2,000th word that just gives me a sort of, not a random, but like an evenly spaced uh, overview of the kind of words that are in there, which is zero, zero, and detlef, and reads, and organ. So you can see that there's like lots of English language, lots of things that are um, possibly misspellings or names or like way, it's like not a misspelling, it's, clear, it's probably intentional, but it's not really um, what we, how we would expect this to be spelled. Okay, but nevertheless, let's just say with this vocabulary that was built automatically and um, run our model. So here, because I'm lazy and I wanna write down a grid, I'm using logistic regression CV, uh, fit it on a train data set, Again, so here our data set is this like 19,000 rows and 66,000 columns. So it's much wider than what we saw so far, but it's sparse. Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't read that, but here you can see that, I mean, the number of stored elements, this is the non-zero elements, and it's much, much smaller than the product of the two. Like this, this matrix is, nearly, is mostly empty. And so I can run my logistic regression model and I get a score of 88.2%. Uh, um, and I can look at the coefficients as I did in other places. Uh, might be a little hard to read. If you look at the slides, you can look at your own monitor. But um, so the most negative coefficients are worst, waste, awful, boring, poorly, horrible, worst, poor, stupid, disappointing, annoying, and so on. And the most positive coefficients are excellent, perfect, wonderful, amazing, superb, today, favorite, love, brilliant, enjoyable. And so they mostly make sense. Like you were, that seems like a reasonable uh, model, maybe if you just look at single words. I was a little bit confused by the today, but I think uh, it's because of the best something today, like 
it's the best thing that ever happened. Um, but yeah, this mostly makes sense. Um, so this is sort of the, the baseline approach of how we can do classification on a free text data set. Um, clearly, we have like another uh, hour to fill, so I'm going to talk about more things. Um, so because there's just many different ways we could approach this, even with a simple bag of work model. So the first thing is, um, or uh, the three things I want to talk about are how do you tokenize? So how do you break up the text into words? How do you normalize words? And what do you want to include in your vocabulary? So in scikit-learn, tokenization is very uh, simple and it's done by a recexp. Um, so this is a recexp. It's uh, bww plus b, which means word boundary, um, alphanumeric character, uh, at least one more alphanumeric character, word boundary. And so this means um, anything is a word that has word boundaries around it has at least two characters that are alphanumeric. So, they could, so this could be numbers at least as, as long as there's two characters, uh, discard single word letters, and if you have a dash or um, an ap apostrophe, that breaks up words. Um, there's much, much smarter ways to do this. Um, but this actually works pretty well uh, in practice. Um, actually, I don't think I'm going to talk about smarter ways. Oh, I didn't put this on the slides, but uh, probably I'm going to post this somewhere. There's, um, I'm going to talk about only using scikit-learn today. And scikit-learn has some things that work pretty well in practice, but it's very baseline. Um, in the next couple of days, weeks, we'll also talk about um, Spacey and Jensen and possibly NLTK. These libraries have much more advanced features that are specific for text processing, and that will give you many more options. Though just using the stuff in scikit-learn is like a good thing to get started, and then you can sort of um, go crazy from there. Um, so this tokenization with the recexp works um, well if, if word boundaries are like obvious from uh, from the characters, um, so it works for some languages but not others. Uh, for languages like Chinese, doing tokenization, you need speci specific libraries that do tokenization, and so things become a bit more tricky. Um, oh yeah, so I can change the token pattern by passing token pattern. So here I changed it so that I allow single character words uh, or I could allow apostrophes in words, um, and then I would get slightly different tokenization. Um, in terms of uh, normalization, so what we did was we just took lowercase, but um, you could also do other things, like you could try to correct the spelling. A thing that's commonly used is uh, stemming, which means reduce to the word stem, or lemmatization, which means reduce to the word stem in a smart way. So here's an example of this. Um, given the document, our meeting today was worse than yesterday. I'm scared of meeting the clients tomorrow. If we stem, stemming is usually a rule on characters. So we'll have, this is specific to the language, so here we have an English language stammer that's, that basically drops things like ing. So you can see our stays the same, meet, meeting becomes meet, today keep, stays today, it also cuts off s and e in the end, so w was, was w gets wa, worse gets worse, and so on. Um, the ed was removed. So this sort of gets uh, rid of some of the different forms of the word you'd have, so scared and scare and scaring would all get to the same word stem. Um, but this is just based on the characters. Lemmatization is something that actually uses a language model and tries to figure out what is the role of the word in the sentence, and then according to this, breaks it down to its base form. So here, uh, one thing you can see is, and I was uh, kind of 
happy to see this. Um, our meeting, meeting is a noun, and so the noun was not changed. Meeting in the second sentence is a verb, and so it's uh, changed to meet. So here it's clear that this, you can't do this just from the word alone, from the token alone. It uses the context of the sentence and figures out um, what, what is the role of the word in the sentence. You can also see that um, was was replaced to be and words was uh, replaced to bad. So the idea of normalization is in a sense to um, reduce the number of features, but also possibly put things together that are supposed to be together. Um, so you're losing some information, but it allows you to aggregate more information because maybe um, the, um, the tense of the word meet is not as important as that it's the word meet. So meets, meeting, meet, met, um, all of these might, uh, should correspond possibly to the same feature. That's the idea here. Yeah, and so I could learn just as lower casing, and if you want more advanced stuff, you can use NLTK or Spacey. So, I mean, this is, was one way to sort of make the vocabulary smaller by uh, combining several words together, say, in the word stem. There's also ways to restrict the vocabulary basically just by um, dropping words. And there are several ways that you can just leave out words from the vocabulary. A very common one is stop words. And scikit-learn has a built-in list of stop words. Um, so you could say stop words equal to English. And if I use my um, example from the beginning, the, um, do you want ants? The only words that are left if I use these stop words are ants and want, because this and is and how are all stop words according to this list. Here there's the list of the one in, in scikit-learn. This one is a little bit weird, the list, but we thought about making it better, but then it's really hard to come up with like the one definite stop word list. And there's many stop word lists out there, and you should probably, if you want to do this, think of what is a good stop word list um, for your context. Like there's bill is, and I think system are in the stop word list, and I cannot think of a reason why they would. Cry. Why is cry a stop word? And if, anyway, um, so you can use this as a starting point, but uh, generally uh, think about w what's important uh, in, your, uh, in your data set. Actually, in uh, supervised learning, removing stop words is not that important. So here, this list is like, I don't know, 200 words long or something. Um, so you lose at most 200 features. So you go from 66,620 to 66,420. It's not a, not a big change. So um, we'll talk about unsupervised modeling uh, on Wednesday, I think. And in unsupervised modeling, this might be more important. The other thing we can do is we can um, remove infrequent words. So what, what I like to do is remove words that appear in less than two documents. Um, that's min df, df stands for document frequency, so the minimum document frequency equal to two. Um, and so if I do that, then uh, my Mallory text becomes ants and you, because these are the only words that overlap between those two. And um, I can also play this game the other way around and say, what is the maximum uh, number of features I want? In that case, I only keep the top max features. So in this case, it would be uh, according to document frequency again. In this case here, it would be ants because do you. Though in this case, it's a bit arbitrary because the document frequency of all the other remaining words is one. And so I think they're, th the order might be arbitrary. Okay, so what does, how does this change our vocabulary if I set mindf to, uh, to two or maybe to a different number? So going back to the um, IMDB example, so here I have uh, 
the first vec has been the ft2 and the second has been the f equal to 4 and now I look at the shape of the original which has minimum document frequency of 1 meaning you don't care how many documents a word is in uh, 2 and 4 and I think it's quite striking that if I remove all the words that appear just once I go from 66,000 to about 40,000 features so I got rid of uh, more than a third of the features that probably didn't really provide any information. If they appear only in excuse me, a single data point, I don't really trust to learn anything from them. Um, and they're probably a weird misspelling or a name or something like that. Um, if I remove everything that appears less than four times, then I get um, 26 uh, or 27,000 features. So I'm now down to um, yeah, less than half of what I had um, in the beginning and I would probably trust that this is about as good. And I can actually run the model and I see it's uh, about as good. Um, this will also actually get rid of a lot of these like zeros that you had in the beginning. I don't think I, I showed this here. Maybe I showed it a little bit later. Um, you, you'll see that 00001 is gone, but 007 is still there. Because movies. Um, anyway. Okay. So this, w this is sort of one main way to restrict the number of like, which words to include. Um, so given the fixed vocabulary, there's another sort of way we can modify the features that is very commonly used in text processing, which is TFIDF rescaling. So here, we are, this is just um, a transformation on the, count vec um, on the counts. So let's say we apply our count vectorizer, we get all the counts with our vocabulary. TFIDF rescaling, um, you can think of it as something like being soft stop words. The idea is that you Okay, TFIDF st stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. This means you want to give something um, a higher score if it appears more often in documents. So TD is how often does, appear, does term T appear in document D? That's just a count. And IDF is the inverse document frequency, means how, in many, how many documents does this appear in? And it's defined um, as this guy, so it's logarithm uh, of one plus number of document total number of documents divided by one plus documents that contain the term. And so, what this means is, if a word appears uh, in uh, appears all the time, then the document frequency is close to the total number of documents. And so then the feature is scaled down. And so it's important it's reduced. And so, so you can think of this as being basically soft stop words. The, the word M and 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 so and the will get basically always a zero score. In scikit-learn, if you do this, by default, it also does um, L2 normalization. What I mean by this is that, well, what the thing that normalizer does, which means um, make sure the vector is of two norm one. So for each row, I divide the row by its uh, by its length, uh, by its Euclidean uh, length. The goal of that is to be independent of the length of the text. So if someone writes a, a review and um, it's very long, it's just in general more likely that some words will appear. And so basically, by dividing by the L2 norm, you uh, discount everything for the length of the document. So if you repeat the same document twice, or like if you just concatenate it to itself twice, it'll have the same representation. Uh, 
um, this TFIDF transformation is uh, implemented in TFIDF vectorizer or TFIDF transformer. So the TFIDF vectorizer does the current vectorization together with the TFIDF transformation. And the TFIDF transformer just does the transformation. So these two are equivalent, so I can just call TFIDF vectorizer on the list of strings, or I can make a pipeline out of the current vectorizer and TFIDF transformer and call that on a list of strings. Um, so this is something that's more commonly used also in, uh, in information retrieval, where there's um, where you care about the distances between um, two documents. So here the, the point is that if two documents share a common word, that doesn't make them very similar. If they share a very rare word, that makes them quite similar. And so basically here you put more weight on um, do, docu do, to do documents share, uh, share rare words that makes them similar. This can also help in supervised learning, but not as much as if you think about similarities. If you do uh, similarity comparisons, this is really uh, quite important. All right. So this is all the things you can do to your, um, to your bag of words. Um, maybe questions so far before I go on? All right. Yes? It's an interesting question. The question is, is it safe to use the stuff in scikit-learn or should we use the other packages? Um, it's particularly interesting for TFIDF. Did, did you look at the slide notes? Because the slide notes say there's more plus ones in there than in some other implementations. And depending on which library you use, there's more or less plus ones. And some people argue about this. And like, I don't think it matters that much. But I think, I think one of the plus ones there is not standard. But I think generally it's safe to use scikit-learn. Um, the most up-to-date will probably be Spacey. NLTK is um, very comprehensive, but it's a little bit of a hodgepodge, and it's pretty old and not get updated that much. Spacey is pretty new, and they have like pretty state-of-the-art stuff. Yeah, so that's, that, that's the issue is like with removing, like if it appears only once, they can't share it, right? Um, like between two documents, uh, like if there's like some space differences, like a rare word occurring between five documents, and then you remove that because you didn't want to Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a trade-off clearly on like which words do you want to keep? Um, and it depends on the application. So... I would say that if you do these document queries and you want to find a similar document, so like information retrieval instead of the, the, the mother of like Google, you have a document, you want to find a similar document. And then you probably don't want to throw away rare stuff as much. Um, I'm usually thinking more in a classification context. In a classification context, I want to learn something about the class. And if I have something very rare, then it might not be informative for the class. Um, so. So I think it, it depends on the context and it also like, but even in classification, if something appears only five times, but it's super informative, I shouldn't throw it out. Okay, yeah, the question is, is there a collection of synonyms? And uh, I'm sure there is. Um, but I don't think it's something that's commonly used because like the rare words might be misspelling. So this is a very common thing. So that's why I said, oh, maybe we could do spell correction and maybe spell correction helps. 
or you use stemming because you have different word forms. Um, or you could recognize something as a name and then say how many names that appear in there instead of having a feature per name, uh, yeah, per, per unique name. Um, but if you, the rare words are usually ones that are very domain specific and that you don't know ahead of time, which is why um, like having something like a, uh, inverse thesaurus won't really help you that much, unless your data set is very small. There's actually something, okay. I, I mentioned this a little bit later, but if your data set is very small, you can use domain knowledge. One thing, for example, that's quite common is if you do something like here where we talk about um, a sentiment like something positive or negative, then uh, we could have a list of, there, there's many lists of positive words and negative words, and I just count how many positive negative words there are and um, use that as a feature. So even if I have a sm very small data set, not all the positive words need to appear within my data set. I just can think of, I have this really long list of words that are positive. And so you can do that, but you, you sort of need to know what it is you're looking for in advance. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is n-grams, which is basically going beyond a single word. I said, back of words completely discard all the context. But um, sometimes context matters. So for example, didn't love and love are very different. If I remove stop words, didn't love and love are the same. Like the representation back of words would be the same. Even if I don't remove st stop words, it's unclear that uh, the didn't and the love become, belong together. So um, these two things will look very similar to a model. The way we can get around this is in um, looking at n-grams. N-grams are co uh, collections of neighboring tokens. So usually what I said before, the tokens are like unigram tokens, where you look at one word at a time. You can also look at bigrams of tokens, which means uh, two neighboring words. So in, with unigrams, we looked at each word individually. With bigrams, we're now looking at windows of two words. So I have this is as my first feature, is how, as a second, how you, and so on. And I can make these uh, longer, so I can look at um, trigrams, I can look at five grams, and so on. And so I can get more and more context. If I make the context size bigger, I will usually get uh, more features, and the, the thing will be rarer. Like any combination of five words is very unlikely to happen. A combination of two words is like somewhat likely to happen again. So here uh, is a toy example. Um, so you can specify this um, in scikit-learn with the n-gram range parameter. That's a tuple of what's the minimum length of the n-grams and the maximum length. Usually you don't want to use just bigrams or just trigrams. You want to use up to a certain length. So the first one is the default, which is the minimum and maximum are both one, so you only have unigrams. The second one is the minimum is two and the maximum is two, so you only have bigrams. Um, here in both cases, the vocabulary size is eight. Usually there's many more bigrams than unigrams. And um, yeah, as I said, usually you want to have unigrams plus bigrams. So it's a little bit more interesting on IMDb data set. Um, here, Wait. so um, for all of these, I said Mindy F equal to four. If I don't set Mindy F equal to four, um, I get way, way more. But like, let's say we have Mindy F equal to four. There's uh, 26,000 unigrams. Um, if I look at bigrams, it's uh, nearly an order of magnitude. It's five times as many bigrams. If I look at bigrams and unigrams together, I have 15, 000, sorry, 150,000 features. If I look at trigrams, I have 250,000 with four grams, nearly 400,000 features. So I get more and more features. Um, but actually, I pruned them a lot here by having this Mindy app equal to four. 
if I don't have mini f equal to 4, uh, if I just use the default, I would have about 8 million features instead of 300,000. Because most four grams are really, really rare. Like any combination of four words that someone uses in a movie review, or most of them don't happen that often. But if I look at all of them, then there's like millions. Another thing that's interesting to consider is um, if you then com combine this with uh, bigrams. So here I'm doing the same. I look at n grams of so one in, of length one and two, so unigrams and bigrams. I have my min df equal to four again. So the four I just picked relatively arbitrary. So I don't think I grid searched that. Uh, I probably should have. Um, and I do it once without stop words and once with stop words. And remember, the stop words are like 200 words. But if I look at, I remove the stop words and then I look at bigrams, whereas it's not removing the, look, the stop words and looking at bigrams, it's a difference of 150,000 features versus uh, 81,000 features. So I nearly half the number of features. Why is that? Well, the most common bigram involving house is probably the house. And so all the combinations um, that are very common are usually combinations with a stop word. It's like, usually if you have a, a verb, you might have an in front of the word or in or, you know. And so these are the most common uh, bigrams involve a stop word. So if you remove all the stop words, all the bigrams that remain are going to be uh, way less common. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then because I was like, kind of wanting to play around with it, I looked at all the, uh, at only four grams. And if you look at all, all the four grams that appear at least four times, you have 31,000. If you remove the stop words, then co compute all the four grams that appear at least four times, you have 369. So this is like two orders of magnitude reduction. Yeah? So when you remove the stop words, you I remove the stop words and then I compute bigrams. So I take the text, I remove all the stop words from it, and then I compute bigrams. It's so different. Yes. Oh, Only have is also a stop word. Um, but uh, basically, uh, if I have Tom and Jerry, then uh, I remove N, and my, so my bigram will be Tom Jerry. It makes sense, trust me. <laughs> Mostly makes sense. Um, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting. So I, I wanted to look at some of these 300, and this is the ones that I found. So these are actually uh, quite interesting. So the ve is not a stop word. It's because of a weird interaction, and don is from don't. There's like some weird interactions between how our stop words list looks and how our tokenizer works, and I don't like it. But um, but you can see fun things like worst movie I've seen. Uh, there's apparently a movie called 40 year old virgin uh, I've seen long in a long time worst movie I've seen um, movies I've seen don't waste time and money uh, worst film I've seen best movie I've seen don't waste time watching don't close on them so I, I thought these were these were great bad 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 is also good um, wait where where is the Lose friends, alienate people. It's apparently also a movie. Um, anyway. So these themes actually pretty informative features. Um, anyway. So what's much more common to do is usually use, um, for classification tasks, for example, use unigrams and bigrams, or unigrams and bigrams and trigrams. Um, so here I did something with stop words included and with stop words not included. Um, actually, you can see in the most important features, nearly all of them are unigrams. 
uh, with the stop words included, there's actually the worst, at all, and not even, not very, uh, love this, well worth, oh, this is with three grams actually in, at the end. So there's a couple of uh, these high order engrams in there. But interestingly, all these important ones, they all contain stop words. So if you exclude the stop words, they all go away. So that's kind of. Um, so actually, if you exclude the stop words, it gets worse. Um, then I, I removed well and not from the stop words, and uh, then, it's, then it gets better again. So main lesson here is uh, think about whether the stop words are important for you or not. Like, um, well, there's well worth and not worth, and they clearly mean exactly the opposite, but if you, ex if you don't have bigrams, you can't model it. If you exclude not as a stop word, you also can't model it. So think about uh, like what you need and um, what stop words you want to throw away. You can play the same game with uh, characters instead of words. So we can basically throw away do tokenization and just work on character levels. Uh, why do we, would we want to do that? that um, like main motivation here uh, is if you want to like detect the language, this basically solves the language detection problem so you can figure out which language a text is in. Or if you have made up words, if people make up new words, if you want to be robust against spelling, if you want like uh, use like an obscenity, or if you want to create an obscenity filter, um, people like obfuscate uh, what they write. And so with character engrams, you can sort of overcome some obfuscation. Um, so here, starting uh, with my favorite string, do you want ends? So you would extract, let's say, if you want uh, character trigrams, you would have a window of size uh, three characters, and just slide it over and extract the, uh, the features that way. So we would have one feature for do space, O space U, space YO, and so on. So clearly, like looking at just unigrams, so single characters, is not very interesting. And usually, here now, you want to look at longer sequences of characters, like three, four, five, or so. Um, yeah, as I said. So you can be robust with misspelling obfuscation, you can do language detection, and you can learn from made-up words and uh, names. So if you basically, if things have some common features, and they might share some uh, character engrams, but they might not share, uh, might not be exactly the same string. Um, so here's, oh yeah, this is a toy example. So you can see that this is the this is the vocabulary on this is how um, this is how you get ants. It's uh, of size 73. If it look only at two and three grams, if I looked at more, the vocabulary would be even bigger. So you can see for this very small data set, the vocabulary is very big. Actually, for very big data sets, the vocabularies will be rather small. Um, you can so in Scikit Learn, you can either do like very naive thing or you can. Respect character, uh, respect word boundaries, which is character wb. So you specify this as the analyzer being character. So by default, it's word. You can change it to character, or you can change it to character uh, with word boundaries. And so, in this one here, you have w space y from how you, and this would not be considered here because they they con. Um, they con they belong to di two different words. So we can actually try to do this on the whole um, IMDB data set again. So this is a little bit silly and maybe not what you would want to do in practice. Uh, so here I use an engram range from two to five and minimum document frequency of uh, four and respect the word boundaries. And I get uh, 160,000 features. So it's actually not that bad. Um, it's more than we had with just single words. 
And, uh, but I get an accuracy that is about the same as what I had before. Turns out on this data set, no matter what you do, you get 88%. Um, but so here you can see that even with this like, very naive approach, we can get a reasonable result. However, I find it's a little bit harder to interpret because um, so these are the coefficients. And you can see that worst and worst and orst and waste and aced and waste and orst, whatever, all there's mm -hmm. like five features for every word that might be interesting. Mm. And so you probably, we could have shared this information if we just looked at the words. Um, another thing that's interesting that I found here though is um, you can see here three and four and four slash, seven slash, seven of 10, seven of one, seven, eight. People write their star scores into their review. So this is leaking the label. If there's seven of 10 in there, it means it's a positive review because they gave seven stars. And seven slash one is seven of 10, but you, you didn't grab the zero. So I didn't realize they were the, lab the labels were actually in the text, but they are, and you can see this here. So that, in that sense, that was kind of informative about the data set. Oh yeah, here I didn't remove the punctuate. Yeah, so that's the default in scikit-learn. You could obviously do it a different way if you wanted to. Oh, okay. So then, so with the character grants, it doesn't remove punctuation, but the word about the normal word grants, does it remove punctuation? The word engrams, they, I mean, they just don't consider punctuation. Punctuation is considered a word boundary. We only look at things within word boundaries. Ah, if you have uh, one sentence ends with one word, so you have a full stop and you start with another word, um, a two gram would, uh, bigram would uh, create a bi, there would be a bi bigram of these two. In, in scikit-learn, if you use um, spacey, there might not be because spacey knows about words. And so you might argue, maybe it should, maybe you shouldn't go across sentence boundaries. And so, um, Second learn is very simple. It doesn't know anything about the English language. It doesn't know about sentences. Um, Spacey understands what sentences are, actually parses the sentence, and so you can restrict them within sentences. I think that's what it does by default, but I would have to check. But second learn has no way to do that. So can these other libraries like Spacey, for example, do they play nicely in second learn? Like do they use the same API or do they use something in a pipeline or something? Question is, do these other things play nicely with second learn? Um, the answer is not entirely, but uh, you can plot them in as tokenizers in the count vectorizer. Um, you probably, you have, yeah, you all have access to my book. There's an example in the book on how to do that. Um, actually, I think Spacey has now, has a transformer. I think they've created a scikit-learn compatible transformer. I tried to uh, convince the author of Spacey to do it, and I think he did it, but I have never checked. So it might be that uh, since the last time I saw him, um, he, he put in a transformer. But generally, the main interface is different uh, from what it is in scikit-learn. But it's not too hard to wrap it, which hopefully they didn't shift it. All right. Um, a little bit more sensible example for using engrams is coming back to uh, the data set on the European Parliament, where now I'm trying to predict the nationality from uh, the name. And so here's the distribution of the people in the European Parliament from whenever I made this slide. I don't know if, that, if the distribution changes. Um, well, I guess United Kingdom will not be there anymore soon. Um, uh, you see, it's like, if I do this as classification, it's gonna be, it's a very imbalanced uh, classification task because there's many more people from Germany than there are from Cyprus. Um, but still, I can sort of, I, I can try to classify and see, can I figure out from the name where someone is from? And so maybe to reiterate here, the 
the names are probably unique. This is a very small data set, so, so even the last names are probably unique. Um, because there's only a couple people from every country, different countries have different last names, but I can still try to figure out from um, common uh, engrams in the names where someone's from. And um, so I use, uh, if I use a count vectorizer on a word level, um, it does like pretty poorly. Why do I use the F1 macro? That's a terrible thing to do. Um, anyway, so this is using um, word, uh, just word unigrams. So this is basically figuring out have I used, have I seen this first name or last name? And you get uh, F1 macro for, of like 0.23. If instead I use um, uh, characters, I actually get a much better score, and that's even with single characters. So if I just count how frequent are single characters, this tells me quite a bit about where someone is from. And then I did like a big grid search and uh, figured out, so I grid searched the C logistic regression, the n-gram range, maybe document frequency, and whether I want to normalize or not. And um, then I get something like, um, point uh, 0.58 um, with a minimum decrement frequency of 2 and an n-gram range of 1 to 5. And so here, so that means I have like, using this uh, the character n-grams from 1 to 5, I can build a like, somewhat reasonable model of where someone is from, from this very small data set of people in the European Parliament. Um, Okay, this is, this is the result of the grid search. Um, so here you have minimum document frequency, here I have the values of C, so C equal to 0 0.001 was very bad. Um, using only five, five grams was also pretty bad, and the other things all do like reasonably well. Okay. Uh, all right. So we already discussed a little bit um, other features. Um, so I just wanted to say, like, this is something you should really think about. What do other features tell us about the text? For example, the length of the text, the number of auto-vocabulary words, does someone use all caps? What kind of punctuation do people use? How much punctuation do people use? Do people use positive words or negative words? Um, or say, uh, how many um, named entities are in, something in, uh, in a particular uh, document, or how many typos are in a document. Um, you can think of like many of these features. And yeah, just sort of think about what, what do you think is most informative for the task. Uh, sometimes I found like that doing character anagrams and then running a model tells me some things I didn't realize beforehand. For example, that uh, the label is actually included in the text. There's also things um, that sometimes help, which is um, in a very common task in NLP is also what's called part of speech tagging, meaning uh, or post tagging, which is um, tagging each word with the role in the sentence, so something like a noun phrase or an article uh, or a verb or is it the object and basically you can get full parse trees and so you could um, count how often a particular thing, a um, particular role happens. Like does someone use a lot of pronouns or do they use names or um, they use a lot of noun phrases or verbs. How would you turn that into integers? Oh, I, I just can't. So I use spacey to compute how many, uh, how many adverbs are there, and then I count them. And that be, okay, so, okay. And that probably, like, if I want to, like, think about the style of writing, then um, these, these properties might tell me something about it. Like for example, you can tell um, the 
I think you, uh, about the gender of an email author by, by how many pronouns they use. Um, uh, do you have an opinion on things like loop, uh, loop? linguistic inquiry and word count? So basically, a dictionary-based feature extractor. Uh, the question is, do I have an opinion of, about Luke? And I don't know what Luke is, so no. At least not an informed opinion. Um, so, we will, so this is the baseline. We will talk in the next uh, week or two about much more fancy feature extraction techniques, particular uh, Elmo and Bird. And uh, these are pretty much state of the art, but you should definitely understand these. Th this is a uh, bag of words, and engrams are the basis of everything else. And you should always try them first, because they are pretty easy to understand. I mean, even I can understand what counting words means. These more complex models um, are much harder to understand. And um, they might give you more semantics, but you lose interpretability. So um, I would always start with these sort of simple features. All right. The last thing I want, oh. Is there a feature in scikit-learn that handles spelling errors? No. So scikit-learn basically tries to do as little text processing as possible. And so, um, yeah. I, there might be in Spacey, I'm sure there's an NLTK. And there's, I'm sure there's, oh, there's uh, lots of like separate libraries. So you, if you want to use scikit-learn, there's like a, the convectorizer has options for preprocessor and normalizer and tokenizer, I think. And for each of these, you could uh, give a callable, and you can have a spell checker be the normalizer, and so correct the spelling. But then maybe also it, it, it destroys some of the information. Like, correcting spelling is not that easy. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, large-scale text vectorization. So this was the back of work model we talked about before. This has um, some downsides if you have a very big corpus. In particular, you need to build a vocabulary over all the documents. If you can't hold your documents in RAM, it's kind of annoying to do. If you don't, haven't seen all of your documents, it's impossible to do. So let's say um, you're doing something on Twitter, and, maybe, and so you get new t news every time, or you're doing something on the news, and maybe something in the news happens that makes a new word appear that you've never seen before. Like, a new person gets elected, and so their name was never in the news before, so it's not in your vocabulary, so you can't capture it. And so you, do, um, so if you're, this is sort of what I would call a streaming setup, if you're in a streaming setup where you keep getting new data, or if you have just too much data to hold it all in RAM, or maybe there's too much data to hold the vocabulary in RAM. If you have like billions of words, um, maybe you can't really, can't really stay, store that or hold it in RAM. And so there's a trick to, um, to get rid of this second step of building a vocabulary. And uh, that trick is basically hashing. So we keep the first step, which is the tokenization, but then instead of using a vocabulary, we use some arbitrary hash. Meaning we, we input the token, the string, and then we, we can compute some hash of it, which is, just gives us some arbitrary integer that is unique. And so, um, so this could be like some arbitrary function on like the ASCII codes of the characters or something like that. Um, and you can define for a hash function what is the maximum uh, integer you want to get out of it. And so you get numbers between zero and that number. Here it's something like um, a million maybe. And so I, I give it a token and I get out um, one of these integers. And now I can use these integers as index into my sparse matrix. And so now instead of having a vocabulary, I look at this, this, my hashing function gives me a hash of uh, 832,412 for this, 
And so I look at my uh, sparse vector and, and entry 832,412, and I count one. So now basically I, I replaced my um, vocabulary with this hash function, which is like requires no storage space whatsoever. Also, um, my, my vocabulary can change and it's fine. Um, the, the main downside of this is that um, usually you cannot invert the hash function. So if someone gives you a vector, you can build a model on that vector, but you can't really interpret what's in the vector. So if, if you find out in the end, oh, coefficient 30,000 was really important, then you can't really say what does coefficient 30,000 mean. You can go through your text, your, your data, compute all the hashes and see what it was that mapped to 30,000, but that sort of a little bit defeats the purpose of uh, not storing your data. But if you do that this, you can later on try to interpret it. Um, the other uh, downside that is sort of a theoretical downside is hash collisions. So if you have this arbitrary function, um, so you're not guaranteed that two different words don't hash to the same integer. In particular, if you limit the number to less than you have words, you will definitely have collisions. Like if I have a billion different words, but I only allow myself a million hashes, I will have collisions. Empirically, people found out it doesn't matter. So basically, you get exactly the same performance because it's very unlikely, like at least in classification, that um, a word that was important gets conflicts with another word that was important or common. And most words are really rare, and so conflicts usually don't really matter. By conflicts, I mean hash collisions. So this is nearly a drop-in replacement for the current vectorizer. The only diff so it's implemented in the hashing vectorizer. Um, the only difference is that by default it uses L2 normalization, but I think you can turn that off. So L2 normalization, again, the goal is to get rid or normalize away the length of the document by dividing by the Euclidean norm of uh, the counts. But other than that, this is exactly the same thing. So you can replace your hashing vectorizer. Sorry. You can replace your count vectorizer by hashing vectorizer, and I'll just take less memory and be faster. And here, by default, you can see that it creates about uh, one million features. I think this is some, it doesn't look like it, but th this is some power of two. I mean, it's supposed to be some power of two, I think. So you need to predefine how many is all your hash. You need to predefine the maximum value for your hash, yeah. Yeah, but then uh, if you can't see, if you don't see the all the documents, your computer is doing documents, how do you know that, like, what hash size you know, capture all? Because, like, Okay, so what, how do I find the right hash size if I don't know how big my vocabulary is or how many different words? And um, the answer is just pick it big enough. <laughs> that, that is, and usually that's pretty easy. Um, the thing is, if you pick it bigger, it doesn't really cost you anything because you don't really need to store the zeros, right? Most of the matrices will be, like here I created um, something that has a million features, but they're all, some of them are completely constant all the time. And it doesn't cost me anything to do that. So um, I'm probably gonna think I'm gonna be safe with a million for most data sets. And if I know, oh, I'm gonna have this really, really big data set, at, maybe I'm gonna use 10 million instead. Yes, you create an arbitrary large space, and if you don't need it, it doesn't matter. Um, because the unused features, yeah, don't cost you. And the score is missing. I blame my TAs from last year. Um, the score is about as good as, in, uh, as using a convectorizer. 
Okay, yeah, so as I said, trade-offs are, it's fast, it works for streaming data and has basically no memory footprint. Uh, the cons are it's harder to interpret the results, it's harder to debug because you don't know what the features mean, and um, the, there could be collisions, but usually they're not a problem in terms of accuracy. All right, and uh, yeah, question? Oh, there, I didn't call fit here. Okay. Oh yeah, that's that's magic. I didn't call like usually in scikit learn I need to fit my model, right? Okay. It, uh, I don't need yeah. to. Okay, but how does it know which which uh, data we're trying to apply on? Oh, uh, here in transform, it, it, the hash is completely independent of the data. It's just it's in scikit learn it's more more hash. It's like some math function that takes in a string and gives you an integer. Here, te text train. So Wait. what's in text train? The training data. So just the, okay, the bit you're looking at, is that you're saying? Okay. 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 I think it's fine. Okay, I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, but I'll, I'll let you go now. So I'll see you Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. No? Yes. I'll see you Monday then. <laughs> <laughs>